This week marks one year since John Paul II was canonized. We talk to the woman responsible for his canonization. We also have new details on the papal encyclical on ecology, and one very special toddler had an audience with Pope Francis. Hello and welcome to this edition of Vatican Connections. This week is the one year anniversary of John Paul II's canonization and we spoke to the woman basically responsible for that canonization. But first, we know that Pope Francis has been working on an encyclical on ecology. Well, we got some more details about that encyclical this week thanks to Ban Ki-moon, the Secretary General of the United Nations. After meeting with Pope Francis, Ban said the papal document is being translated and could be released in June. He also said the key message of the encyclical is that protecting the environment is an urgent moral imperative and a duty for all people of faith. Now, we've also learned that the encyclical will have two key themes, human steward as stewards of creation and the current state of creation as described by scientists. Of course, as soon as that letter is released, we'll have in-depth analysis for you right here. The conference that brought Ban Ki-moon to the Vatican was called Protect the Earth, Dignify Humanity, and Catholic News Service spoke to two of the experts who participated in the day-long event. Climate change always has been happening. The question really is one of whether there's human-induced climate change. And I think there's more and more compelling evidence that there is, in fact, human-induced climate change. If we look at what, what it is that causes climate change, which obviously are the greenhouse gases, the, the, the question that comes up is, well, what's causing those greenhouse gases? Most of it is caused by what goes on in our homes, our heating our homes, our cooling our homes, and so forth. The next big thing is how we get around. Here in Cambridge, we don't even own a car, my wife and I, so we can ride our bike. But in the United States, we did own a car, and we drove it quite a bit to get back and forth to work. And then the final thing is how we use our land. Um, are we deforesting? Are we having good crop productivity on the land? And, and so forth. We are basically using the air as a garbage dump. And we've been doing this for the last hundred years or so. Everything is accumulating. So we're expecting more droughts, severe weather events, storms. Everyone will be impacted by it but particularly the three billion poorest people in the world, because when you have severe drought, they would lose their income. Carbon is something that is so deeply embedded in our economy, in our provision of energy, that it has simply been almost impossible politically to get people to make the magnitude of change that's been required to reduce the risk of climate change. It's very difficult for me to understand the politics of what's going on. But the thing I want to point out is that all the nations have agreed climate change is a serious problem. So there's no issue there. 97% of the scientific community have agreed that it's, uh, climate change is real. And they agreed it's caused by human activities. And they agreed that if we continue on this business as usual, it's going to get a lot worse. The reason that many climate scientists get pushed towards taking a very firm position on climate, the position being that it is absolutely happening, there is no scientific uncertainty, is that they realize there are very powerful forces on the other side trying to stop climate, uh, climate policies from going forward. I sometimes call it, and with no pun intended here, there is a church of climate change. You know? and, and in the church of climate change, if one doesn't believe passion 
passionately that there's anthropogenic climate change and that there must be immediate re reductions in CO2, you're sort of sent off as, as not a, a proper member of the, of the group. Um, but the, the majority of people who work in climate science, who work in climate policy, tend to be a little more centrist in that regard. They tend to think that this is a big enough challenge, a big enough risk, that we shouldn't be placing this risk onto future generations, and therefore we need to find a way to institute global climate policy to reduce these risks. While the environment is an increasing concern, there are also several different crises going on in different parts of the world, and they have the Vatican's attention. In Iraq, people who fled their homes to escape ISIS are still living in refugee camps under really dire conditions. Cardinal Leonardo Sandri is in Iraq right now, visiting those people, trying to draw attention to their plight, and calling on the international community to do something to help bring peace to the region. Cardinal Sandri started his visit in Baghdad, where he celebrated the Divine Liturgy in the Chaldean Cathedral there. He was also scheduled to visit Erbil and Ankawa to visit people there who were displaced from the plains of Nineveh by ISIS. Now, just before he left for Iraq, Cardinal Sandri told Vatican Radio, he just wants his presence and the presence of different church aid agencies there to give Iraqis hope for the future. In Nepal, where the death count continues to rise in the aftermath of the recent earthquake, Pope Francis has sent $100,000 to the local church to help displaced people in that country. Cor Unum, the pontifical council that coordinates the church's charitable giving, said the $100,000 was just a first donation. Meanwhile, the apostolic vicar to Nepal, Monsignor Paul Simic, told Asia News, a Rome-based church news agency, that the situation in Nepal is one of panic. He said people have lost homes and are mourning their loved ones, but for Christians this should be the moment to put faith in action. And he called on all Nepalese to be responsible citizens, to help each other and to make sacrifices as needed. Now we learned last week that Pope Francis will can canonize Junipero Serra during his visit to the United States. In preparation for the canonization, the North American College in Rome hosted a study day on Junipero Serra. While Serra is credited with evangelizing what became America, some people believe he actually forced people to convert. So the study day was meant to help dispel those myths. And in the spirit of dispelling myths, there are reports surfacing that Pope Francis wants to declassify Vatican records related to the church in Argentina during the country's dirty war. That was when people who were considered dissidents were disappeared by the military regime. Pope Francis met with a group who represents the family members of people who disappeared during that period. Both the president of that group and the Pope's secretary, Monsignor Guillermo Karcher, later said the Pope wants to declassify documents from that period. Now, the documents would be Vatican documents about the church in Argentina received from the church in Argentina at that time. The hope is that declassifying those documents would reveal what the Vatican was being told about the situation, how much Argentine bishops actually knew, and how close they were to the military regime. And finally, the church has made a lot of efforts in recent years to be present online, especially on social media. Even Pope Francis is on Twitter. This week, Twitter released a data showing that while Pope Francis is not the world leader with the most Twitter followers, he is the most influential leader on Twitter. On average, Pope Francis's tweets in English get over 7,000 retweets. Twitter's report was aimed at showing how the social network can be useful for modern diplomacy. This week marks one year since Pope John Paul II was canonized. Now, we all know that after someone is beatified, another miracle needs to be attributed to that person in order for their canonization to go ahead. Well, Floribeth Mora Diaz was healed through John Paul II's intercession 
on the day of his beatification, and her healing was the miracle that led to his canonization. I had a chance to speak to her earlier this week about her healing and her life today. For those watching who maybe are not familiar with your story, can you tell us what happened to you? Well, in 2011, I suffered a brain aneurysm. This aneurysm made the whole left side of my body to be paralyzed. And the doctor said that the treatment they did had not done anything for me in the sense of stopping the stroke in my brain. I was sent home and told that I only had one month to live. And at a certain point, knowing that modern medicine and doctors couldn't do anything, you and your family started praying. Tell us about that. We've always been very strong believers. We united more as a family because we had a very huge suffering. Asking God that if it was His will to heal me, to help me move forward or to die, because it was always going to be His will. Clearly, you're here with us, so it was God's will that you were healed. Tell us about the healing. Ese momento fue el día de la beatificación de Juan Pablo II. That was the day of the beatification of John Paul II. It was a special moment because I was in bed. I couldn't move. But I could watch the broadcast from Rome. And since there is an eight-hour difference between Rome and Costa Rica, so you could imagine, it was two in the morning. I was on medication to help me sleep because it was difficult. That night I woke up and I am not sure how I woke up. The first thing I did was take the remote control that I had by my side. My husband always left it there so I could watch. Then immediately I fell asleep. I fell asleep watching the broadcast. But at 8 in the morning of that day, it was something incredible to hear the voice of John Paul II in my room. Incredible, I say. God, I am alone and I am hearing voices. Of course it's surprising, but I heard it again saying, Get up, don't be afraid. I remained motionless, but perhaps what gave me the certainty of what I was experiencing that moment was that I had a magazine on top of the TV in my room. It was a magazine with the image of John Paul II, and I had it in front of me, and I could see how his hands, how they came up out of the magazine, inviting me to get up. And when I heard the voice once again, and watching what I was watching, I did not doubt in seeing that something extraordinary was happening. And I answered, yes, Lord. That's all I answered. Yes, Lord, and I got out of bed, as I've always had. Since that day, for the glory of God, I am on my feet. We're now at the one-year anniversary of the canonization. Tell us a little bit about that day for you. That was a very special day. It was definitely something incredible since I arrived in Rome for the canonization. They were very exciting moments seeing the people, primarily that there were a lot of pilgrims from Costa Rica. But then on the day of the canonization, I had been told what I had to do, that I had to be serious when carrying the relic. I had to be as discreet as possible, not turning and looking from side to side, but it was impossible. I had millions of people around me, flags fi flying behind me. To one side, people calling me not by my name, but how I was called in, in Italy, La Miracolata. I heard it and could see from the corner of my eyes. I smiled a bit because there were so many people greeting me, and I would make a small gesture, but I couldn't greet anyone back. Then it was hard because I was getting full of emotion and I would pray, God, please help me. Help me because I don't want to cry. I have to be strong, and I need to do what I need to do. But the truth was that the emotions were so strong. You have no idea. With all the tears along my journey, it was incredible because for me, having been in bed and seeing Sor Mary take the relic, but now it was me. 
pero ahora era yo. What do you do now? How has life changed? Because so many people want to be close to you and touch you and hear you because for them you are a witness of the greatness of what God can do. What do you do to make sure that you, that it doesn't become about you, Floribeth, but it becomes about you, Floribeth, as an expression of the greatness of God, that God remains at the center of all of this? Now the world was seeing me and I was saying, my God, thank you, because I was praying as I walked, giving thanks to the Lord. But as I always tell people, Flori was not the center of this moment, it was God. That's why I was walking up the aisle, as a witness to the greatness of God, of what God can do when we believe in Him, and we have that faith that is strong in the Lord. Everyone was seeing what God is capable of doing for us, of giving us life when doctors say there is no hope. God has the last word. My life totally and definitively changed. It changed in every sense, from being a normal everyday woman, just like any other mother or grandmother. We started having thousands of journalists outside our house. I was constantly giving interviews, answering phone calls, receiving visitors. I received many people who came from other countries to see me. I had the duty to receive them, not just from my country. There were many tourists who came to my house. They were also interested in what had happened. And this meant I was constantly talking about the same thing. They wanted to see the reality of what had happened. The most important thing is that I always ask God, Lord, be the center of all of this. I don't care if they see me. I want them to see what you did in me. In that sense, I took advantage of having the media around. There were so many media outlets that approached me, and they were important to me. Not all the reporters had faith, but regardless, I knew that the interview would reach many corners of the world. And for me, the most important thing was to transmit, through those interviews, God's love for us, how great our Lord is, and what He can do in our lives. For me, that was the most important thing. Take that message of faith and hope to every one of those countries whose media came to me. I gave interviews not because I wanted to be on TV, because I can't get used to being interviewed, to being in the news. I do it because I know that is the way I will reach people who are not close by. That is how I offer my service to the Lord, spreading the message of faith and hope. That is my goal when I give interviews, because Flori is not the center of all of this. All of this is so that many people can convert, so many people can draw close. Those people who feel that God is not a living God. I assure them that yes, God is a living God. And I show them that I am standing before you now through the grace of God. Thank you so much for being with us here today and for sharing your story with us, your experience with us and reminding us of the greatness of God's mercy. Time to take a look through the Pope's busy schedule this week. On Monday, Queen Sylvia of Sweden visited Pope Francis. She was at the Vatican to participate in a conference on human trafficking sponsored by the Swedish Embassy to the Holy See. She was accompanied by her daughter, Princess Madeline, and her granddaughter, Princess Leonor. Now, Pope Francis and Queen Sylvia discussed the activities she supports in favor of children, and Pope Francis thanked her for the way Sweden has welcomed refugees. But after the formal conversation was over and the photo op began, it was little Princess Leonor who had the Pope's undivided attention. Then Pope Francis met with the bishops of Benin on their ad limina visit. And then he met with the chief rabbi of Rome. On Tuesday, Pope Francis met with the president of Ecuador, Rafael Correa. He was also at the Vatican to take part in a one-day conference on climate change. And the Secretary General of the United Nations, Ban Ki-moon, took part in that same conference. And Pope Francis also met with him. We know they discussed the Pope's upcoming encyclical on the environment. Wednesday was the general audience, and Pope Francis continued a series of talks about marriage. CNS has the details. Il seme cristiano della radicale uguaglianza tra congiugi deve oggi portare nuovi frutti. La testimonianza della dignità sociale del matrimonio diventerà persuasiva proprio per questa via, la via della testimonianza che attrae 
la via della reciprocità fra loro, della complementarietà fra loro. Per questo, come cristiani, dobbiamo diventare più esigenti a tale riguardo. Per esempio, sostenere con decisione il diritto all'uguale retribuzione per uguale lavoro. Perché le, le donne si dia per scontato che devono guadagnare di meno degli uomini? No, lo stesso diritto. La disparità è un puro scandalo. Nello stesso tempo, riconoscere come ricchezza sempre valida la maternità delle donne e la paternità degli uomini a beneficio soprattutto dei bambini. I cristiani, quando si sposano nel Signore, vengono trasformati in un segno efficace dell'amore di Dio. I cristiani non si sposano solo per se stessi, si sposano nel Signore in favore di tutta la comunità dell'intera società. On Thursday, Pope Francis met with members of the Community for Christian Life and later with members of the Cursillo Movement. Let's take a look at the resignations and nominations that were announced this week. Bishop John Wester of Salt Lake City has been named Archbishop of Santa Fe. He takes over from Archbishop Michael Sheehan, who reached the mandatory retirement age. In Greensburg, Pennsylvania, Father Edward Malisic has been named as the new bishop there. And at the Vatican, Pope Francis has created a five-person commission to oversee changes to the Vatican's communication and media offices. The five people on that commission are Father Dario Viganò, the director of Vatican Television Center. He will serve as the president of the commission. The other members are Paolo Nussinier, the layman who runs Avenire, the newspaper that is owned by the Italian Bishops' Conference. Father Lucio Adrian Ruiz, he is the head of the Vatican's Internet Service Office and the Director of Telecommunications for Vatican City. Jesuit Father Antonio Spadaro is on the commission as well. Now he's the editor-in-chief of the Italian Jesuit journal Civiltà Cattolica. And finally, Monsignor Paul Tai from the Pontifical Council for Social Communication. Monsignor Tai was actually on the commission that made the recommendations that will now be implemented. That's all for this edition of Vatican Connections. Join us again next time for more about what's going on at the heart of the church. And until then, you can follow us on Twitter or check our blog for regular updates or watch us on demand on Roku TV. From everyone here, thanks for watching and see you next time.